pressure, I have to be good, it sounds like tonight. So, let me tell you how you can be good. Stay in the Bible. If you stay in the Bible, you'll be pretty good. Let's go to Matthew 24 as we keep studying. Gosh, just missing a week has made me feel like I missed a month. Alexis and I went to Florida for five days. We celebrated our 30th anniversary. That was August 3rd. And uh, so we're just a little bit delayed on doing that. And met up with a friend in, from Alaska that's staying down there that built a hospital in Uganda. So we had a nice African visit and uh, got a little bit of sunshine. But we're, we've been talking about the end of times. According to Jesus, what are the signs of the end of the times? Pretty serious stuff. If the Bible's true about the end times, it's going to get worse than it is now. And Jesus wants us to be prepared for that. Part of me would really like to give you the introduction for Sunday. Sunday, but I'm not going to. Sunday, I am uh, in John 1, 35, and I'm calling it uh, Boot Camp Begins. It's the beginning of basic training. I'm calling it that because that's what it is. Jesus is preparing his disciples for war. And if you've been here since I've been here, we remember Genesis 3.15 where God declares war. I will bring enmity against you. God saying to Satan. God declares war on Satan. Because of what Satan did to Adam and Eve, God declares war on them. Enmity means constant conflict. And God wants us to know we are in constant conflict with our enemy. And I appreciate our Lord fighting for us. Amen? So he declares war on Satan in Genesis 3.15. And he declares war on sin and beats both of them at the cross. The cross is an absolute destruction of sin, absolute destruction of Satan. Uh, Satan is wounded. He's mortally wounded. He's eternally wounded. But he's not dead. He's still dangerous. He'll be, he's deceiving now and he'll be deceiving in the tribulation. And Jesus will get us ready for the tribulation. Uh, somebody sent me something, a little bit of a lighter note that I thought, uh, would be better on a Wednesday night than Sunday morning. And I wrote a little note. If you think uh, your church has problems, here's what was sent to me. But we'll be in Matthew 24 in just a minute. The Presbyterian Church called a meeting to decide what to do about their squirrel infestation. That's pretty serious. After much prayer and consideration, they concluded the squirrels were predestined to be there that they should not interfere with God's divine will. At the Baptist church, the squirrels had taken an interest in the baptistry, so the deacons met and decided to put a water slide in the baptistry and let the squirrels drown themselves. The squirrels liked the slide and unfortunately knew instinctively how to swim, so the next week twice as many squirrels showed up. The Lutheran church, this may be just for you, Jason, I don't know, the Lutheran Church decided that they were not in any position to harm any of God's creatures, so they humanely trapped their squirrels, set them free near the Baptist Church. <laughs> Thank you, my Lutheran friends. The Episcopalians tried a much more unique path by setting out pans of whiskey around the church in an effort to kill the squirrels. With alcohol poisoning, they sadly learned how much damage a band of drunk squirrels could do. But the Catholic Church came up with a more creative strategy. They baptized all the squirrels, made them members of the church now. They only see them at Christmas and Easter. That may be my favorite one. There is one more. Not much was heard from the Jewish synagogue. They took the first squirrel they caught, circumcised him, and they haven't seen a squirrel since. So, <laughs> so you think you have troubles. There is a church in a town with all kinds of troubles. I'm going to try to get more spiritual tonight than that. But I thought that was nice. The proverb says, laughter is good medicine. I appreciate that. I hope you remember something I said tonight. Let's pray. Father, thank you for divine scripture. Thank you for revelation, insight, truth, the standard of truth, a book that is inerrant, inspired, breathed out by you, breathed out of your mouth, according to Jesus, according to Paul. These are your words. Thank you that you've preserved them. 
We know that your word has been attacked uh, for really since the beginning of time, since since Satan attacked them with Adam and Eve. But Lord, thank you for the for the gift of preserving them. Thank you, Jesus, for telling us about your second coming even before you completed the mission of your first coming. And I thank you for the encouragement, Lord, that you do care uh, about sin, that you will one day uh, take your own vengeance. You say vengeance is mine in Romans 12. I will repay. Lord, I only say that not just because it's on my mind, but it's on my mind and my heart because it's a reminder that vengeance is not ours as a church. Vengeance is yours. For us, we are to offer hope and grace. We let them know that there is looming and impending judgment. There is a judge that could be called a Savior. They would bow. They would repent. They would turn. They would find you so patient, so gracious. And I pray, Father, that we would find our role and be faithful in our role and at the same time let, let, let the listeners know what's coming down the pike. Lord, I just pray that you would open our eyes, our minds, and move our feet when we leave here tonight because of your word. Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, I'm gonna, you, there are notes in the back. They're a, little bit, they're a little bit tweaked and new, so if you didn't get one, maybe if some of the men can grab some of them, not that ladies aren't capable of that, but I think it's courteous for the men to do this. So if you don't have notes, raise your hand. If you for, lost your notes, raise your hand. There are a few extra scriptures tonight. We'll get them to you. And uh, we're about three weeks away from finishing this series on the signs of the end of the age according to Jesus. He knows what's going to happen. He knows. When he was on the earth, he set aside some of his divine attributes, and he made the statement at that point he did not know the time or the season. That didn't matter to him. He was totally focused on his first mission, but he knows when he's coming back, and he talked about it in the book of Revelation. So let's get notes to you, and, and uh, let me do a little bit of review from the notes. Why is there so much confusion about the end of the age? Number one, the Old Testament writers and even the New Testament disciples did not see two comings of the Messiah, the Redeemer, the Savior. They read, they had to uh, read over and over that the Messiah would suffer and the Messiah would reign, but they didn't see that in two advents. They, they did not see two comings. One, where he'd be a lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. The second, where he'd be the lion of the tribe of Judah where he would not die but take over reign for a thousand years, set up his millennial kingdom, uh, and then after that uh, establish eternity for his people, all of his people from the beginning of time. The second reason there's confusion is because the Old Testament didn't see a church age coming because it was a mystery. While it was in there about the Messiah being a suffering servant and a coming king, it wasn't in there about a Gentile age, an age uh, that where God, God's work would be led not by the Hebrew people, but by Gentiles. That's what's happened the last 2,000 years. Matter of fact, there's some confusion in 1 Corinthians 14 uh, where it says, by strange lips um, uh, my kingdom will be led. That's not speaking in tongues, that's speaking in non-Hebrew language. Strange lips are English and African and and uh, Spanish, something other than Hebrew. Those are the strange lips that Isaiah prophesied. They didn't see a church age, but if you look at your notes, Romans eleven twenty five, Romans sixteen twenty five through twenty seven, they say exactly that that God has a plan for His people. Uh, Gentiles would come in church age, and then He will restore His people and finish His plan and fulfill His promises to Israel finish his plan, and fulfill his promises to Israel. There's an argument in Romans 9, 10, and 11 that Paul uh, talks about, and it, it's this. God makes incredible promises in Romans 8. Nothing will separate you from the love of God. He makes incredible promises in Romans, and it begs the question, God didn't keep all of his promises to Israel, so why should we think he's going to keep his promises to us? And it's a good question. 
So you have Romans 9, 10, and 11, and what he really says is God's not done with Israel. He will finish his work and fulfill his promise. This is about God keeping his word. It's so critical. Coming up to, uh, excuse me, coming up to Matthew 24 and 25, you see this context in the last week in the life of Christ. Triumphal entry coming into Jerusalem and cleansing the temple. He, he clarifies the great commandment to love God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength and love our neighbor as ourselves. There's no debate, folks. Love is the driving force of God's people, of God's work. And th that's why it says in Ephesians 4, 15, speak the truth in love. 1 Corinthians 13 says, love, uh, love rejoices with the truth. There, there's a worldly love that says, I can't, say the, I can't say the truth, it will hurt you. God says, if you love people, tell them the truth. Tell them the truth. It is not loving to leave out the judgment of the gospel when, when sharing your faith. That's not love at all. It's contrary to love. So love, loving God, loving God, being the arms of grace and the arms of mercy and his missionary arms, his ambassadors, 2 Corinthians 5 call us. We are his ambassadors, his representatives. By the way, you can be a good one or a bad one. I told my, <laughs> I think this is funny, I told my youngest son two years ago, he was 19, he moved back to Alaska after welding school and we had the heart-to-heart the, the -heart talk and man-to-man -man talk or man-to-young man talk or whatever and I said, son, uh, I pastored up there for nine years and there, there are not any other people over there named Hun and your, your, your name is Hun and I tried to do good up there and tried to honor God and uh, don't, mess, don't mess up that name, son, is what I'm trying to say when you go up there. And he said, what do you mean, Dad? I'm like, well, you know, you just, it matters. It, it matters about that. And I was talking, 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 and, and I thought I was getting through to him. And he said, do you, do you want me to change my name? <laughs> no, no, son, I just want you to change your behavior. That's all. I did. He actually said that. Look, look, everybody here, you call yourself a Christian. Every one of us in this room have been good ambassadors for Jesus. I know that. I know you have been that, but we've all at times as well been bad ambassadors. Sometimes we've misrepresented him and we've had to say, I'm sorry, Lord. We've had to say to a neighbor or a friend, um, I, I've had to do that. And, and I've had to go back to people and say, I did not represent Christ properly. And I, 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 I had, we have to do that, folks. The world's not rejecting our faith because... Um, we're, we're not perfect. They're rejecting our faith because we're not real. We've got to make, we just got to be real. We've we got to get remove all the obstacles uh, from people, all the excuses from people, because they're lame anyway. We don't want to give them anything like that. Three, the seven woes of Jesus upon the religious establishment. It's the re religious establishment that really spearheads his execution. Peter would say on the day of Pentecost, you killed him, God sent him, you killed him. God sent him, but you killed him. We are responsible. And he pinned it on the religious establishment that day, the day of Pentecost. And Jesus let him have it. Why, why would he be so rough on them? Because leadership influences people. Leadership matters. I'm not more important to you, but if Satan can bring me down, he can knock down more bowling pins than when he can knock other people down. There's just tr that's just true. It's not about importance, it's about strategy. And if there's anything that we've learned in the last few days, my heart is broken over the Robbie Zacharias stuff. Broken. And I'm actually shocked. I put something on Facebook today about accountability. Accountability is not fun, but accountability is essential. Accountability is essential. Accountability is our friend. Pray for us as we hold each other accountable on the staff and pray for us as we try to shepherd you and hold you accountable. Uh, Accountability is uncomfortable, but it's necessary. Amen? For the destruction of the temple, and that's really important because that's how chapter 24 opens up. Let's look at chapter 23 through uh, 2337. 
and then I'm going to read all the way till 31. Jesus is speaking. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. It's a bad reputation to have. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you would not, would not resent resisting the Lord. See, your house is left to you desolate. I read that again because I'm going to talk about desolation tonight. Your house, your house is left to you desolate. Is he talking about their, their homes where they live in? I don't think so. He's talking about the house of God. That's the context, the house of God, the holy house of God. Well, we, he's already turned over the tables when he began his ministry. And he's already turned over his tables as he ends his ministry because of what they've done to the house of God. Not only did they not make it a place of prayer, not only did they make it a place of profit, but if you know your temple at all, and if you don't know it, then you can figure it out by what I'm about to say. You can find a picture online, maybe in the back of your Bible, but m most scholars believe where they set up for, to exchange animals for the sacrifice and exchange money, where they set up was in the court of the Gentiles. And if that's true... They blocked the way of people coming to God. They blocked the way. That may explain more. Jesus even said that uh, in his woe chapter of Matthew 23, where he said, you, you, you aren't going to heaven and you're blocking the way of others. He let them have it. Look, you better get in the way or get out of the way. Christ is coming. The train, the gospel train is coming. And you better get on. And I mean this. We have, pan, we have sort of pandered to the world a little bit and sort of backpedaled a little bit. The gospel train is moving and it's not going to stop uh, for you to figure it out in the wilderness. You better get on. There's an imminent, uh, imminency and an urgency to our message that we, we've lacked. We've lacked. So he says, your house, the holy house, the house that David wanted to build, that Solomon did build, the house that was dedicated. So many great things happened there, but so many bad things happened there, and over time it became not a place of prayer, but a place for the flesh. It's left to you desolate. Desolation is the result of the crucifixion. Everything he's saying is, because you're killing your savior you're going to get punished desolation is connected to crucifixion for i tell you verse 39 you will not see me again until you say blessed is he who comes in the name of the lord chapter 24 jesus left the temple was going away when his disciples came to point out to him the buildings of the temple but he answered them you see all these do you not truly i say to you there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. As he, sat on the, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Of course they did. Saying, tell us, listen to these questions, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming? And they connected a question to that. And the close or the end of the age. When will this happen? What is the sign of your coming? And Jesus said they're gonna, this is all going to happen in rapid succession. That's what he's about to unpack. Jesus answered, See that no one misleads you. No one leads you astray. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ. And they'll lead many astray. You'll hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed, for this must take place, but the end is not yet. Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are but the beginning of birth pangs. If you're new here, and I know we have a few, few new folks here tonight uh, since this series started, verse 8 is a sort of a hinge pin. Uh, Jesus is comparing the end of the age tribulation to a pregnancy, and the birth pangs don't happen in the first month or the second month or the third. They happen at the very end of the ninth month in a normal pregnancy. I, I understand they're... Uh, 
we have preemies all the time that are born. But think nine months. This is the end of the nine months. This is a, there's about to be birth. And what he's saying is everything I'm about to say is going to happen in rapid succession at the very end. It didn't happen a thousand years ago. Some of it didn't happen. And then, and then today some of it's going to happen. And then a thousand years that's going to happen. It's all going to happen together. That's critical to understanding what Jesus is saying here. And if you don't understand that, then you're going to miss the whole point. It, it disconnects. And that's why when you read, if you went to a bookstore, there'd be 47 different interpretations about what I'm reading. And that shouldn't be. These are but the beginnings of birth pains. Verse 9. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation. And he means the tribulation, which he'll clarify in this sermon. And you'll be put to death. You'll be hated by all nations for my sake. They'll unify against you. Can we, can we bring the world together? Can, will, will we ever bring, be able to bring world peace? The only thing that's in the future for this world, the only thing they will unite for is to fight against us. Don't put your hope in the United Nations or any other nation. Many will fall away, verse 10. Many will betray one another, hate one another. Many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. We've talked about that in, in horrible detail. About just how cold it is now between husbands and wives and murder and children and families and murder. And just how, how cold we are to life, the sanctity of human life. It's going to get colder but the one who endures to the end will be saved. How will we know who the true people of God are? Who are the chosen ones? Who are they? This language, they're the ones who endure. And you know how, you, you know how we endure? By the strength of God. It's not that I'm tough, that I, I have willpower. Willpower won't get you anywhere in the tribulation. You better have God's Holy Spirit power. Willpower is not going to do it. This is not pressure on us. It's God's way of saying, if you really believe in me and you've really trusted in me and I've set my seal in you, you will endure. Now, I don't know how I'm going to do it. I don't know how I'm going to stand up to it, but I know I'm going, I'm going to stand up to whatever is facing me up until that point. I don't think I'm going to be here as my, my understanding of, of the revelation, excuse me, of the tribulation is. But I have to st we have to stand up even now. Uh, to that we see in the gospels that even the gospel of john we'll see in john 6 many of his disciples walked away from him they walked away well what does that mean well the bible says first john second peter 2 first john 2 18 19 second peter 2 22 they say if you come and you leave and you'll come back you were never of us never is a bad word if you're on that side of it the one who endures to the end will be saved. Thank you for that, Lord. This is a boost of encouragement. So is verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. Verse 14 comes alive in the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation, there's world evangelism like there's never been before. Every single person will hear a clear gospel presentation. That's exciting. That's encouraging to me. You know, I, I was writing something, Sonny, you were talking about the post, and I was writing something about um, my life and, and some of those struggles. One thing I almost wrote, Sonny, was my other mantra is life isn't fair. There's a lot of unbelievers that, that choke on that phrase. I, I choked on that phrase for a long, long time. Uh, don't tell me about Jesus. Don't tell me about that. Life isn't fair. Life has not been fair to me. Uh, if there is a God, he doesn't like me. What did I ever do to put myself in a broken home? What did I ever do? I mean, Satan just, he just fans that flame. Life isn't fair. And, and Satan's strategy eventually backfired when Penny Fisher from Lebanon, Tennessee, told me what my dad had been telling me, and she said, you, you better believe it's not fair. It's not fair that Jesus died for your sin. That's not fair. And I mean, that wasn't a two-by-four to the head, it was a brick. 
I never forgot that. I don't want it to be fair. I don't want what I got coming. Life, my mantra was so, cl was so close to being true. Life isn't fair. Thank you, Jesus, that it isn't fair. See, I, I didn't have the life of, the, of, the, uh, La of Lazarus, right? The rich man Lazarus. I didn't have his life. But when you read his life, that he's crippled and he's begging for bread and he's got a, a, a his whole earthly life has been he's been disadvantaged and the contrast there in Luke 16 19 through 31 is with a rich man who has everything opulence dressed in purple has everything he wants even has a funeral which this other guy didn't, didn't get and Jesus speaking says to the rich man who's in hell you in your lifetime had good things, but Lazarus, bad things. But now, but now, you're in torment and he's in bliss. It's not just that they're in a different place. Here's the point of that scripture. Here's the point of, of Psalm 73 that connects with that scripture, Psalm 73. Here it is. We get tripped up as an, I got tripped up as an unbeliever, and then we get tripped up as believers when we forget that this living on this planet is a blink and a flash. Boom, it's over. So the man was disadvantaged for a blink of time, but for all eternity, he enjoys the presence of God. For all eternity. We have to think that way or we're going to get discouraged. I'm getting ripped off in the here and now. But you're, uh, but you're good in the sweet by and by. W where's your perspective at? That's why people die for Jesus. You, you, know who, you know who really wants to rapture more than anybody else? Persecuted countries. The Soviet Union, when we finally got in the Soviet Union, when we finally sent missionaries in the Soviet Union, you guys probably know this. I don't know. Uh, Japan is more of a, a pretty successful pretty pretty flourishing nation but places like the soviet union where the persecution was so heavy in those block countries you know the doctrine that they ask our missionaries about when's jesus coming back they're not worried about job promotion 401ks the next grandchild they want out of here and i like all those things but i but we should want out of here as well amen that's why he's writing this. And, and that's why God is, allow, is allowing things now, giving us a little taste of what's to come. We're, we're just here for so long. My, my dad used to say, and then Coach Hunt so, said some of the same thing. My dad's famous line when I'd say, Dad, that's so hard. He said, you can stand on your head for 10 minutes if you had to. Well, what's that got to do with moving tires out of Dad had a, what? Stand on my head. But the truth of that is, Man is going to wrap me out, but that's okay. The truth of the matter is, his point was, suck it up. Suck it up. Shiny, suck it up, man, right? Toughen up, church. It's going to be over before you know it. Your life has flashed before you. I'll be 58 this year. That's crazy. That's old. Now, I know some of you are older. Wait a minute. It's as old as I've been. I've never been older than this. This is as old as it gets for me. This is to encourage you to stay strong, to get up, get off the mat. Life's going to beat you down. Life's going to knock you down. God's people get back up. And when you walk by somebody who's been beaten down, God's people get them up. That's what we do. That's who we are. We don't pass people by. That's not what we're about. We're still on mission. Vengeance hasn't come yet. But it should motivate us to get our act together. More of, your, more of the outline here that you picked up. I want to read all this. When will the signs be? When will these things be? What are the signs you're coming? Signs of the end of the age. Luke 19, 11 reveals to us that the 12 disciples supposed that the kingdom of God was going to appear immediately. They were wrong. The events of the past few days affirm their erroneous expectation. They embrace Jesus as Messiah, Redeemer, and Savior. Check one. They embrace John the Baptist as the prophesied forerunner to Jesus. Check two. Jesus entered Jerusalem uh, as the rightful king to the praise of Hosanna. Check three. 
Jesus cleansed the temple, claimed authority over all that goes on there. Check four. Jesus confronted and rebuked the compromised religious leaders, put them in their place. Check five. Then he predicted the destruction of the temple. Check six. What is left to do except take over and restore Israel? Surely the obvious conclusion is that Jesus would soon manifest his divine glory by removing the Romans, replacing the Jewish religious establishment. Surely Jesus would subdue all other nations, bring them under complete submission, just as the prophets foretold. Then finally Jesus would set up his eternal kingdom and all believers of all time would enjoy the first taste of heavenly bliss, a bliss that would last for all eternity. Eternity. What was left undone? What else was required? Three things. The death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. They, the, he's, he had told them that he was going to die several times, and they didn't want to hear it. Peter even rebuked him. Do you remember that in Matthew 16? Ta-da! He did a Barney Five, blah, 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 blah. Really? Peter? G- Jesus doesn't know what he's doing? Before you're too tough on Peter, have you ever read the Bible and you say, "Ah, I'm not sure God really understands my office situation here. You want me to do that? That doesn't work for my boss. God's word works for everybody. And by the way, if it doesn't work, if if you walk in God's word, this is a great counseling thing that you'll hear from Randall. We're going to teach God's word. And if God's word doesn't work in your conflict, guess what? There's no resolvement to your conflict. That's how you know it's unresolved. That's it. We can say, there's not going to be peace. Romans 12, as far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. You've done everything you can. You keep serving the Lord. If they soften up, you keep reaching out to them. But you've walked in the word of God. There's nothing else you can do. Move on. Don't be distracted. Because Satan will try to distract us. What else was left? Why didn't he set up his kingdom? He was going to die, he was going to be buried, he was going to rise again, and he would send them out on a great commission to save the nations, to bring salvation to every tongue, every tribe, every people. They didn't see that, they didn't understand that, but that's what he did. Let's keep reading, verse 15. So when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet daniel standing in the holy place now the holy place is the temple the temple was destroyed in 70 a.d by titus vespasian the roman general who later became roman emperor history tells us that they don't have a temple today over there therefore if this is true and it sure sounds God's not tricking us. There's no code here. If this is going to happen, there has to be a temple rebuilt in Jerusalem. Has to be. I got people, friends, I love them. They're brothers and sisters in Christ. We disagree a bit on what's going to happen on the end days. I say, I just don't understand why there needs to be another temple. What's that have to do with the fact that he said there was going to be one? What do you mean you don't understand? There's already been a sacrifice. Maybe God just wants there to be a temple where we offer things for him. It doesn't matter what we understand. It's there. It's true. There are a lot of things true. I don't, I don't understand how I'm getting to heaven, but I'm, I know I'm going. How did he get me there? What? If you gave me the math, Einstein would have nothing on you. I, I don't understand it, but I know it's true. And then he makes a parenthetical statement that is helpful also to our interpretation. Let the reader understand. Let those who read this, that's that's pointing to to the future. Let the reader, not the hearer, the reader, the one down the road. He's letting us know this is what's going to happen at the end. We're not in the end is what he's saying. I've got a great commission plan. Little did they know, by at that point, we know that it's at least 2,000 years of great commission. But once, once the abomination of desolation happens, that's the light switch, folks. That's the switch. Okay, so let me back up and, and help you understand what I meant by the switch. There's going to be a rapture, I believe the Bible teaches, a rapture of God's people. We go up. Remember what I said a couple weeks ago? The rapture, believers go up. Uh, 
we, believers go up, uh, and there's great comfort. We meet the Lord in the air. In the second coming, Jesus comes down, we come with him. There is carnage, not comfort, but carnage. In the rapture, we go up, second coming, he comes down, all the way down to the ground. In the very middle of the tribulation, three and a half years in, the abomination of desolation happens. That's all I'm going to tell you. The rapture happens, and then for three and a half years, it's peace, it's good. Uh, the Antichrist is, is going to be called Frederick or something other than the Antichrist. I don't know what his name is. That's my middle name. Uh, and so, I, I, so for three and a half years, there's peace, it's all good, and the, wor- the entire world trusts him with everything. Daniel says that the Antichrist sets himself up as a friend of Israel when he's setting a trap for Israel. He's in charge of the entire uh, economic system of the world, one world government, spiritual, military, financial. It's pretty much all there is. That's the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation says what I just said. Okay? So rapture takes place, and then what's the key point once we're gone? What, when does the peace and the phoniness and the fake unity, when does that stop? When the abomination of desolation takes over. Halfway in, Satan says, okay, now I'm God. I'm not just a world leader. I am God, and I will be worshipped. You will worship me. You will take my mark. If you don't, you won't eat. If you don't, you may die. This is when it all starts. This is when it all breaks loose. Halfway in. Three and a half years after that, Jesus Christ returns. He returns. That's it. Those are the three major events of the seven years. The rapture, the abomination, and the return. And I'm trying to keep it simple for me, not just for you. Look at verse 16. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains when he does this. Get out of town. Let the one who's on the housetop not go down to take what's in his house. Let the one who's in, who's in the field not turn back to get his cloak. Alas, for women who are pregnant, for those who are nursing infants in those days. Pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. Why? Uh, as I mentioned to you, in Israel, on the Sabbath, nothing electric runs. Nothing electric is allowed to run. You will not be, you want to talk about chaos. Verse 21, there'll be great tribulation. He's talking about tribulation earlier, right? Uh, earlier up, uh, up in the, where, where was it? Where was the first time he mentioned tribulation? I'm trying to find it. I, I read it earlier. This is, a great, this is what he's talking about. The, the context here is the great tribulation. And notice what he says in verse 21. There will be great tribulation such as not been from the beginning of the world till now, no, and never will be. There's nothing that can compare to this. It's as bad as it gets. There's been local tribulation against God's people. There's been national, regional uh, persecution. There's never been total global persecution. There will be. This is total, global, final, right? I don't know why I can't find that word, tribulation. Somebody help me. Verse 8. No, I don't, it's not verse 8. 9. There it is tribulation that that, that I, I just what i'm trying to do is go back to let you know i'm interpreting this passage by the passage i'm not i, I don't want you, you to think this is my interpretation this is what jesus is saying he's connecting that with what i just read verse 22 if those days had not been cut short no human would have been saved that's how bad it'll be but for the sake of the elect those days will be cut short and then if anyone says to you look here is the christ Or there he is, do not believe it. For false Christ and false prophets will arise, perform great signs and wonders, as to lead many astray, if possible, even the elect. See, I've told you beforehand. I told you this, I've told you this, I've told you this. But if people don't read the word, they're not prepared when trials happen. So if they say to you, look, he is in the wilderness, don't go out there to look for him. If they say, look, he's in the inner room, don't believe it, don't go in there. For as the lightning comes from the east and shines as far as the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. Wherever the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. That's very clear language. This is Armageddon-type language. This is is an Armageddon reality. There's going to be a battle, and the the rulers of this world will gather an army and fight uh, the Lord as he comes from the sky. Now, 
I told you this phrase that my grandfather used, that is a step below stupid. To fight the Lord, sin doesn't make sense, folks. It doesn't make sense in your life, my life, or in this day. People, I just can't believe somebody would throw their life away. You're trying to make sense out of sin. Why would somebody, you're trying to make, don't, sin isn't sensible. Sin will devour you. We are, when people are living in sin, they're feeding a dog that bites them. That's, that's not sensible. That's the sinfulness of sin, which is a phrase in the Bible. That's the sinfulness of sin. It's so deceiving. So deceiving. I've told you beforehand. Verse 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened. So we know this is what happens at the very, very end. The sun's darkened, the moon will not give its light. Stars will fall from heaven. 2 Peter 3 talks about this as does Revelation. Powers of heavens will be shaken. You remember I read from Hebrews 12, everything that can be shaken will be shaken, but Hebrews says we have a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. Uh Uh-oh. Uh-oh. They'll see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory and he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call you know when trumpets are used in the bible they're used for several things they're used for celebration they're used for worship but they're also used to warn the watchman on the wall if you're not familiar with that the watchman on the wall they would blow the trumpet in zion and and sound the alarm i love that song that great jewish song it's a warning but there's also a trumpet when you attack So the trumpet was an instrument of worship, warning, and attack. And this is an attack. This is Christ is coming back, and he's going to finish it all. The great scripture of Revelation and the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our God and his Christ. He's he's finally taken back. What rightfully belongs to him, right? He'll gather his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other and one of the things that i think is helpful in in our study tonight is is looking at luke if you'll flip over to luke i just want you to see uh, luke tells us something this is why it's good to look at some of the parallel passages in the gospels to see how they tell a little bit more a uh, different side of the story this is from uh, luke 21 if you go there luke 21 20 through 24 He does not give as much detail. He gives a lot of detail, but not as much as Matthew. So I chose Matthew. But Luke tells us something that Matthew doesn't tell us. Look at verse 20. When you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies. See, we didn't know that from Matthew. So let's let's do our homework, make sure we put all the pieces of the puzzle together, and go, okay, Luke just added to the story. When you see Jerusalem, armies surrounding jerusalem then know its desolation has come near now he's talking about abomin- the abomination of desolation verse 21 then let those who in judea flee to the mountains so he's he's saying the desolation is going to happen when you see the armies surrounding them these armies are brought in for the false sense of protecting israel but they will actually attack israel instead and I don't want to cause any kind of world alarm or world problem, but Russia is a part of the problem here. The great army of Russia, they've always, they've always had a problem with Israel. They'll be a part of the problem. China will be a part of the problem. The Bible says in Revelation 200, there's an army of 200 million that are coming. There's no nation that can, comes close to that except one, China. I just was looking up boot camps and um, the different lengths of boot camps for my sermon on Sunday and how long is Air Force and Army and Navy and Coast Guard, they're all a little different. They're all shorter than the boot camp of Jesus, which was three years. But while I was looking this up, I just kept finding different sites and found one, stumbled upon one that talked about 
nuclear submarines we're number two but we're a long way behind China China Russia Turkey that whole region they're all going to turn on Israel they're all going to gang up on the little guy Satan has inspired that. Satan hates Israel because Israel is a place God loves. Israel is the apple of God's eye, the place of Zion where God would have his missionary people. He started, God started that nation from nothing, if you will. Deuteronomy 7, 7 and 8 says, You weren't mighty, you weren't great, there were not many of you. God started them sparse so he would get the glory. He's left them sparse in a sliver of land that should have been devoured years ago. The only explanation for the existence of Israel to this day is the protection of our God. No other explanation. By the way, the United States recently with their new president has reestablished um, the Palestinian Liberation Organization. Now we're giving money back to them. Their organization exists for the elimination of Israel, and we're now giving them money again. God help the United States of America. God help the United States of America. That's biblically unwise, biblically uh, foolish. Biblically, we're asking God to judge us. How I pray, how I pray. Lord, I don't know what all that means, but it can't be good. Let those who are in Judea flee the mountains. Let those who are inside the city depart. Let not those who are in the country enter it. For those days of vengeance to fulfill all that was written. Alas, for the women who are pregnant. For those who are nursing infants in those days. For there will be great distress upon the earth, global, and wrath against this people. What people? God's people. They will fall by the edge of the sword and be led captive among the nations. And Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until the times of Gentiles are fulfilled. They resent God's love for Israel. They resent that Jesus was a Jew. Salvation's from the Jews. Amen? Jesus said that in John 4. Honey, remember, you remember this. You know where I'm gonna, what I'm going to say right now. Maybe you do or don't. We were in a uh, little town of Texas pastoring a town. The town had 32 people in it. Who prepared me to pastor you guys? There were more bulls in the backyard than there were people in town. That's true. That's not just funny. And uh, we had nine people there when I started pastoring and uh, 16 when I left. Half the town, if you were paying attention to the numbers. So I believed in shepherding now and I believed in shepherding then, so I went about visiting people. And one visit... I had, well, I'm in seminary, Kenny, I never will forget this. No other visit I've ever had like it since. A sweet woman and her daughter. Her husband didn't come to church very often. I think I may have seen him once. And when I, when I saw him, we went to his house and told me that he hated Jews and blacks and all non-whites. Yeah, I think I'll take that cup of coffee, sir. Yeah, I think... Uh, I'm going to be here a while. He had very racist things, posters up. Said he believed that God would honor him if he eliminated minorities. He was an active member of the Ku Klux Klan. I just couldn't believe it. And I was holding on to my wife's hand because she wanted a piece of him. Don't let my little house on the prairie wife fool you, okay? Amanda. She's got a little spunk in her. All the cute ones do. It's a side note. We talked and talked and talked. God was with me that night. He was. There have been times I haven't handled myself well uh, in the ministry. There are times that you have to just wish you had a do-over, right? That night, God just held me together. And he said, uh, I, I heard him out. And I said to him, I'll hear you out if you'll hear me out. But boy, I had no idea what I was about to hear, right? He said, the problem in the world, minorities. And the answer to the, to the world's problems, the Klan. It's okay. Well, um, I'm here to tell you that uh, the problem of the world is the sin of mankind, of all mankind. It's not, not minorities, it's a majority. All have sinned. 
And the answer is Christ. Felt like that we had an easy contrast. Minorities, clan, sin, Christ. And then I said, because he claimed to be a Christian, he had his Bible out there, he was, I'm serving God by eliminating minorities. He claimed to have killed people. I don't think he did. I don't, he barely walked, let alone shoot a gun. But anyway, that's separate. And so I said to him, how can you have your Bible and how can you hate Jews when Jesus was a Jew? He said to me, Jesus wasn't a Jew. And I thought, got that rope around his legs. Let me see your Bible. I showed him that. Conversation was over. He didn't want to talk anymore. Thought he was serving God. Thought he was serving God. Hated the Jews, but believed he loved Jesus. That's the confusion we're dealing with. Maybe that stranger situation. I wish I was telling you I made that up. That's all true. And on the way home, my wife said, I love you. I'll yield to you. You're my husband. But I ain't ever going back there again. <laughs> Kim, you appreciate that, right? There's time you got to eat the showbread, right? All right. How much time do I got? In your notes, if you'll jump down in your notes on the back page on number six. Number six, the abomination of desolation. And by the way, the abomination of Antichrist setting himself up in the temple as God brings desolation. That abomination brings the desolation. It's an abomination to God, and God responds by desolating. Um, well, well, the Antichrist will desolate, but God will also do that to another degree. Daniel 9, Daniel 11, Daniel 12, I'm not going to go there, but three times in Daniel's prophecy does he talk about the abomination of desolation talks about the false peace talks about the false treaty talks about the armies talks about all these kind of things i want you to know that but i want to go to two places i may i may have to finish this section next week but let's go to second thessalonians chapter two if, if if one thing i would second thessalonians look in your bible and it'll tell you what page that's on if you look at your index I'm not saying this to be funny. This is really, really helpful. If you're a new believer or you're not really comfortable finding different books of the Bible, make a photocopy of your index page that tells you what page the books are on. You'll actually, that will help you, but it'll actually help you start learning where the books are. That's a good cheat, if you will. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, Paul is picking up this theme, and why wouldn't he? It hasn't happened yet. Paul's going to talk about it. Many, many years later, in the book of Revelation, chapter 19, it happens. It, it, I mean, it, 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 not, it happens. It's, it, it's going to give a description of what happens in that day. So Revelation 19, I think I'll do that next week, 13 and 19 next week. What I'm trying to do is to show you, here's where Jesus said it. Here's where Paul reinforced it. Here's where Peter reinforced it. Here's where it happens and what it looks like in Revel Revelation 13. Uh, if you want to study this this week, is the abomination of desolation. You'll see the first and second beast come uh, out and be part of this takeover, this hostile takeover and the mark of the beast. And then Revelation 19 is the second coming and the battle of Armageddon. So I want to give you all that. But let me just read this before we close. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, helping the readers then and now. This will help us, I believe, understand the times that we're living in. Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and are being gathered together to him. I mean, you can't miss the context. We ask you, brothers, the Thessalonians, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed. Now, that's why, that's why Jesus gave us this. This is why Paul gave us that, not to discourage us, but to prepare us. We're to be prepared people, not paranoid. Either by spirit or a spoken word, or a letter seeming to be from us. Sounds like there's some deception out there, doesn't it? To the effect that the day of the Lord has come. The day of the Lord is not the rapture. The day of the Lord is the second coming. The day of the Lord is judgment. The rapture's comfort. The day of the Lord. The doomsday of the Lord. The Old Testament prophets wrote, prophets wrote about it, wrote about it, wrote about it. I really preached on it a little bit a Sunday night, uh, 
with Isaiah 1. But at, when, when the prophet spoke about the doom of the end of the world, there was always a glimmer of hope. But come, come to me, reason, be reasonable, come to me, right? Let no one deceive you, verse 3, Paul says, in any way. For that day, the second coming, will not come unless the rebellion comes first. That could also say until. There has to be a major rebellion before the second coming. All right? Well, he's going to unpack that. And the man of lawlessness is revealed. That is a word for the Antichrist. He doesn't care what the laws are. We have a very Antichrist society in America. It's been that way for several years where people don't care. Judges don't care what the laws are. Right? So it's just going to be bigger and, and worse. When he is revealed, see, that ha before the second coming, there has to be something else. The son of destruction who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. It's exactly what Jesus said. The, the, this is not a zigzag. This is a straight line, right? Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things, but they're rattled. They're rattled by other people saying uh, bad things are happening in the world. That must have been the tribulation. No, tribulation is at the very end. And when the tribulation starts, it will all be finished at the end. And verse 6 says this, And you know, he's going to bring the rapture, not just the abomination, but now he's going to bring rapture language into this. Listen very carefully. And you know what is restraining him now, so that he may be revealed, so that he may be revealed in his time. What's restraining? What's restraining the, the enemy? Well, the will of God, the prophecy of God, the timetable of God. But the restrainer is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's restraining him. Without the Holy Spirit, uh, he would be unrestrained. I mean, duh. I mean, it's just that simple. But there's something else. He possessed the Holy Spirit. We don't have all the Holy Spirit. I mean, the Holy Spirit is not, is not less. When, when I got saved and he gave me some of his spirit, he didn't become less of a Holy Spirit, okay? But God's people are possessed by the Holy Spirit. And God's people possessed by the Holy Spirit are called salt and light. So just follow me here. Salt and light. Salt meant one thing in that day, to slow down the corruption of meat. Salt was to slow down corruption. By the way, a little side note, but salt was so valuable that it was sometimes it was paid wages was given in salt the word salary comes from the word solarium comes from salt salt was very very valuable we're called salt we're very valuable we're in this world and because we're in this world listen to me we're restraining we're slowing down the corruption around us we're in the way of the ungodly who want to be more ungodly we are we're blocking them we're restraining them because we're salt and we're light when the rapture takes place the salt is gone the light is gone the holy spirit within us is gone and god takes his hand off this world it's unrestrained does that make sense that that's what he's talking about and then he says this for the mystery verse seven the, the mystery of lawlessness is already at work we know that then and we know it today only he who now restrains he who now restrains it will do so until he is out of the way and then the lawless one will be revealed see he's hiding who he is and then he'll be revealed take over and there's a battle whom the lord jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth that's revelation 19 that's exactly what it says he will kill with the breath of his mouth now kill him but he will live forever don't miss that with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming the coming of the lawless one is by the activity of satan with all power and false signs and wonders be very very careful of living in an age where people want signs and wonders if you're possessed by signs and wonders you'll be fooled over and over and over again Here's all the signs and wonders you need. 
You can trust this. You can trust it. With all the wicked, with all the wicked deception for those who are perishing, verse 10, because, why are they perishing? Because they refuse to love the truth and be saved. Do you know there's consequences for rejecting God's revelation? Consequences for rejecting the fact that he put in every human a conscience to know what's right and wrong? Consequences that God said in Romans 1 through Paul, everybody knows there is a God. God put that reality in them. They don't know they need a Savior. They're blind to that, but they're not blind to the the reality there is a God and they have a conscience. They have to suppress the truth and unrighteousness, Romans 1 says right so what are the consequences when you push away the obvious the obviousness handy work fingerprint of god verse 11 this will trouble some people therefore god sends them a strong delusion you want to you want to live the deluded life i'll give you delusion You want to play games with me? Kill my people? You want to play games? Psalm 2 says this, God laughs from heaven at them. Not my word, his word. God sends them a strong delusion so that they may believe what is false. That's called the consequences of stubborn sin. In order that all may be condemned, those who did not believe the truth but had pleasure, took pleasure in unrighteousness. Well, forgive me for going over four minutes. I would tell you I will give you those back next week, but I don't want to give them back. So um, it's amazing stuff. I know some of this is repetitive, but it's just gleaning. We're gleaning, gleaning, and gleaning. I'm comforted by this, that God is in control, uh, that we do not have to be shaken um, when elections don't go our way when when we hear about troubling things happening in the world i'm i'm really troubled and concerned about our country in texas and louisiana because of what's happening to them with this cold so i want to remember remember those folks and pray that as calamity happens in our world it's opportunity for god's people so let's pray for opportunity and uh talk to uh we met with a texas couple today that moved from california bakersfield to mckinney texas to Loudon uh, to Teleco, and uh, she knew some people down there. I talked to my father today, and Louisiana has been hit hard. And and every time creation groans, listen to me. David Kozak knows this because that's where disaster relief comes into play. Where where Samaritan's Purse, we have a ministry here, disaster relief and Samaritan's Purse. Why do these places exist? They exist because we know creation is groaning. We know creation is falling. And every time there's a disaster, salt and light people show up and say to them, there's more to this world than the the calamity you find yourself in. We're opportunistic. We take every opportunity we can and reach our tentacles. I like that. I I like that word. You know what I like about it? You've heard me say this. Uh, We we back our Bible clubs and feeding first feeds and just all tentacles when i when you hear me say tentacles i'm not just talking about reaching out i'm 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 doing a little bit more than that you know what what an octopus does when it reaches out with those suckers it grabs them and brings them in we're tentacling out to bring people in let me get you real excited so that they can park in your spot (laughs) and sit in your pew can i get an amen? amen yeah you hypocrites you're going to be mad. Some of you are going to be mad. Praise the Lord. Give your spot up. You know, if we're going to have revival, it's going to be uncomfortable and inconvenient. But somewhere, somebody's got to make room for the people God wants to save. So let's make room for them. Okay? Let's pray. Father, thank you for the hope of the truth. I wish it was going to get better on this earth. But Lord, you are letting sin have its course, take its course. Thank you for saving us out of our own sinfulness. Thank you for paying for our sin. Payment. One payment for all of us. 
Thank you for rising again, beating death. Death has no sting because you're alive today. You paid for sin, you beat death. We don't have any bigger problems. That's it. Sin and death have been conquered in Jesus' name. And so we leave here today encouraged. I pray that we leave here bold, bolder than we came in, humbler, filled with compassion for the people that we meet along the way. Some will be obvious that they're hurting. Others will hide it the best they can. But as we draw near to them, they won't be able to hide it. So give us your eyes and your heart, your mind, your feet. Help us to be your hands. And help us to do whatever it takes to reach our community. Come what may of comfort and convenience, Lord. Have your way in this church and may we rejoice as we get out of your way and ask your kingdom to come alive on top of this hill, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Please don't leave if you want prayer.